Thank you very much for that song, uh, Hism. Um, we'll now in the part of our commitment service and uh, our dinner speaker is no other than uh, Dr. Neftali Manes. Um, previously, he was uh, a New Testament professor here in Ayas. Um, he also was connected before in the Adventist University of the Philippines as the Dean of the College of Theology and also my professor in uh, many subjects in New Testament. And also he became the Vice President uh, for Development Affairs of that university. After his term in the Adventist University, uh, he became the Ministerial Secretary of the North Philippine Union Conference. And after uh, some years, he became the Executive Secretary. And later on, he became the President of the North Philippine Union Conference. And now, he is uh, the President of the Northern Luzon Adventist College. Um, he, studies, he studied his uh, MA uh, in Andrews University and also in IAS for MTH and for his PhD in Scotland. He has uh, five children and, of course, one wife. And um, he is an inspiration to me why I took uh, biblical languages. Uh, he is my favorite teacher in languages like New Testament, uh, Greek, but I took uh, Hebrew. Okay, but uh, I had a good uh, background in uh, the language because of uh, Doctor Manius. Now, let's welcome Doctor Manius to lead us again to the Lord as we commit ourselves to Him. Let's welcome Him. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, um, Pastor Ron, for the opportunity you gave me. This is a wonderful time to be here with you today. It's not very often that I am able to come to this place. Well, I come here every now and then to go to the library, look for some friends, but not to come to a place in a meeting like this. So I am very privileged. And thank you for that introduction. I was thinking he would still give some more, but uh, <laughs> anyway, thank you for your welcome. And I'd like to draw our attention here today to what we have been working on, religious pluralism. You know, all of us are members of a particular denomination. We're all Christians. And the average Joe in the world looks at his faith and carries on with what he believes, never ever considering the ubiquitous implications of his religion to others. After all, religion is a universal given, and every man makes his own choice which one to follow. And out of that, problems come. One problem, one problem is this, every single person claiming to be a follower of a particular faith is always wanting to push others to consider his religion first and then convert others to it. The sole reason being that his faith is the right faith, no matter what and how others claim it to be contrary to theirs. This one problem actually exacerbates the problematic situation which we call pluralism, and I mean today, religious pluralism. Were it not the case, and were it not, were it not because of the human desire to experience affinity and closeness with one another, religious pluralism would not be what it is today. Why is that so? Well, consider the following. 
Christianity has only one Bible, only one Savior, one Lord and Master. But look at what this religious pluralism did. As of July 13, today is the 14th, yeah, as of yesterday, Christianity has over 50,000 denominations, sects, and whatnots spread in all the countries of the world where Christianity exists. Christianity should be named actually unanimity in a single united faith, or should it be unity in one accord? However, instead of unity or unanimity, we have all types of group in Christianity as if somebody in the Christian faith had ordered that the faith should be divided. I'm not saying that the divisions within Christianity came out because of religious pluralism. What is most vital for me to say is that people acquired their own view of the faith. They have become wiser, have become educated, they have done analysis, and in their social interaction with people, discovered that there are things that they can do and things that they cannot do. In the long run, they came to acquire a perspective where people are forced to make conclusions which actually lead them to see others as they should be seen and feel as well that people have a right to make their own decisions or choices. Such choices somehow became the skeletons from which religious pluralism emerged as it is now. Talking about Mohammedanism, Buddhism, and other faiths, you will agree with me that, that just like Christianity, each of these groups have given way to varying sects and groups, which as a whole gives us a portrait of religious pluralism. Well, we need to ask some questions. We've answered some of them actually, but let's go back to this religious pluralism. What is it, really? If you believe in um, pluralism, you believe that people of all races, classes, religions, and backgrounds should be able to get along on equal footing in society. There should be no problems. Everyone should live peacefully, and everyone would be enjoying each other's company. In a sense, that is what religious pluralism should draw our understanding to. The ideas of validity within a sphere of peace, unity, security come to mind, and people in these postmodern days get attracted to it. The thing is, as far as Adventists, Orthodox Adventists are concerned, the definition does not jibe well with them, with us. Ideally, Religious pluralism should lead the people or the world into a peaceful situation where people, because of their belief in pluralism, because of, of its validity for peacemakers and easy life within ideal concepts, would be able to understand each other and live peaceably forever. However, this is farthest from the truth. We're all SDAs here, or am I... Okay, uh, we all belong to a faith anyway. For SDAs, they would normally prefer, ideally, want to live amongst their brethren, believing that doing so, there will be less problems and have a better living environment. However, this is only partially true. We now understand that no man is an island. We need to relate with each other, even outside of our faith, to configure one another. And as we know, the world is not our own. Others also live in it. And the same thing can be said with Muslims and Buddhists and all other people with religions. With SDAs, we face a huge problem for, as we look at the idea of peace, prosperity even, and uh, security, when we look at those things and then we face the commission of Jesus he gave us in Matthew 28, 19 to 20, we are going to have problems. Because Jesus said, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, 
baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Look, the simplest definition of religious pluralism with its very ideal setup and considering the intricacies of the gospel, gospel and preaching that gospel, one has to be very careful in balance, balancing the two. Which two is this? Well, re religious pluralism and preaching the gospel. When we try to balance it, many questions come to our minds and uh, after balancing it, we are faced with a question. Which way should a 21st century Seventh-day Adventist adopt, accept, and follow as a way of life? Which master dictum should a principle of Jesus follow? Jesus as his Lord, Savior, and Master, or the very ideal, life-changing tenets of religious pluralism? Pluralism is ideally a good way of life, but must Christians wrestle with it, accept it, live within its ideals, or follow the path of Jesus in plain and simple discipleship? Well, let me make this point come out. God definitely is not the God of pluralism. The scriptures clearly draw attention to the uniqueness of God's character and what he values. God is one and he had one purpose in creating humanity to express his unique love as only God can do. You know what that love is? Divine love. It's so lovely. It's so beautiful. Satan, however, disrupts this beautiful, lovely love of God. Where God came up with this divine plan by drawing the human attention to what we consider sin and sinning. And what sin represents and how he creates things that we don't realize are the inventions of Satan. Actually, and to be direct about it, shall I call religious pluralism a rallying cry for the devil in this century? Born by socialists, philosophers, wise people, professors, theologians, demographers, and many, many others. Religious pluralism is drawing our sights to many other noble items of great designs and perfection. And in my brief readings on religious pluralism, I encountered three things of extreme value to our dear subject here. And I'm referring to enlightenment, humility, and Tolerance. Allow me to use their adjective equivalences as I briefly analyze religious pluralism. So the question must be clear in our minds. Are the elements of religious pluralism valid and understandable? Let's look at religious pluralism. Many people call religious pluralism as a sort of enlightenment. But the question is asked, is religious pluralism part of an enlightened whole? Do all religious paths teach that every situation lead to the same God and that such teaching is more enlightened or educated? In truth, all religions have their own views on God, which in many ways are distinct from one another. In short, religious views of God differ. If so, it would seem far from enlightened to claim that all religions lead to the same God when their views are, in fact, radically different from one another. This claim of religious pluralism contradicts the tenets of the religions themselves. So, subscribing to religious pluralism because it is more enlightened or more educated view of world religions is not only unenlightened, but also very inaccurate. And I, I need to point that out because this is something very, very important for our consideration. So it comes to us that 
religious pluralism is unenlightened because it's very inaccurate. The next question is, is religious pluralism humble? Because people, as they um, try to cooperate and live within religious pluralism, they seem to have obtained the idea that people following religious pluralism are humble. So the question is asked, is religious pluralism really humble? Well, religious pluralists continue to insist that there are many ways to God. Why would educated people persist in an accurate, in an inaccurate view of other religions? Uh, one major reason is because they believe in religious pluralism or participating in activities of religious pluralism being an act of humility and love. And we've heard many people ask questions. Who am I to judge someone else's religion to tell them that they are wrong? This implies, of course, that maintaining Jesus is the only way to God. With that sentence, it appears as arrogant. So, we keep on asking, is religious pluralism humble? Well, being arrogant and maintaining truth are two things that we need to clearly understand. Arrogant insistence on your beliefs actually runs counter to the life and teachings of Jesus. However, just because someone is arrogant doesn't make that person right or wrong. You follow what I'm saying? Not because a person is arrogant, he is wrong. Or not because a person is arrogant, he is right. Arrogant insistence on your beliefs actually, yes, they run counter to Jesus, but the arrogantly right person, you see, this is something, this is an attitude that we always are faced with. Arrogant people, when they talk to others with an air of arrogance, they have that idea and they have that attitude because they know that they have the right answer. It might not be nice, but it doesn't mean that they are also wrong. For all the Christians who are arrogant about Jesus' exclusive claims, there are many who have ardently searched religions, compared their claims, and humbly come to the conclusion that Jesus was telling the truth and that personal faith in the Messiah is the only way to God. Now, this doesn't make them arrogant. It makes them instead authentic. They are willing to stand by what they are discovered, what they discovered to be true. Insisting on what is true doesn't automatically make a person arrogant. There are both humble and arrogant ways to insist on Jesus' claim that he is the only way to God. After all, it is Jesus who said it. And Jesus was quintessentially humble, especially if he is who he said he was. Is Jesus a humble person? Yes, he was. Is Jesus a person who is calling us also to be humble? Yes. Jesus was asking all Christians to follow him in the ways of humility. By contrast, religious pluralism exclusively insists that its view, what is the view of religious pluralism, that always lead to God. Every path leads to God. That may be true, while all other religions are false in their exclusive teaching. See, what religious pluralism does is, even though it's really, you know, ordinary people doesn't look at it as a sort of an enemy, but those people who are following religious uh, principle, uh, religious uh, principle is something that leads them to understand or misunderstand many things. Um, many faiths like Islam, Hinduism, Judaism, and Christianity have their own claims. 
But the claim of the religious pluralist is arrogant because it enforces its own belief on others. It says to other religions, you must believe what I believe, not what you believe. Your way isn't right. In fact, all of your ways are wrong and my way is right. There isn't just one way to God. The religious pluralists are saying, there's not one way to God. All ways are the same. All ways are equal. There are many ways. You are wrong and I am right. This can be incredibly arrogant, particularly if the person saying this hasn't studied all the world religions in depth and makes a blind assertion and comes up with a question, upon what basis can the religious pluralist make this exclusive claim? Where is the proof that this is true? To what ancient scriptures, traditions, and careful reasoning can religious pluralists point? I will say this, that the lack of historical and rational support for religious pluralism makes it a highly untenable view of the world and its religion. So finally, we get to the third point. Is religious pluralism truly tolerant? People, people often hold to religious pluralism because they think it is more tolerant than Christianity. I believe that Christians should become some of the most accommodating kinds of people, giving everyone the dignity to believe whatever they want, not enforcing their beliefs on others. And we should winsomely tolerate different beliefs. Interestingly, religious pluralism doesn't allow for this kind of tolerance. Instead of accommodating spiritual differences, religious pluralism blunts them. The claim that all paths lead to the same God actually minimizes other religions by asserting a new religious claim. When someone says all paths lead to God or to the same God, they actually blunt the distinctions between religions, throwing all of them in one path. And they say, see, they all get us to God, so the differences don't really matter. You see, this is not tolerance. That one is power play. Following RP or religious pluralism does not mean tolerance since people are told that they may submit to a new religious claim. Religious pluralism, despite the fact that this isn't what those religions teach. When it does this, religious pluralism places itself on top of all other religions. People spend years studying and practicing their Religious distinctions, they, to say they don't matter is really highly intolerant. And the very notion of religious intolerance assumes there are differences to tolerate, but pluralism is intolerant of those very differences. In this sense, religious pluralism is a religion of its own. It has its own religious absolutes. That is, all paths lead to the same God and requires people of other faiths to embrace this absolute without any religious backing at all. As it turns out, each of the reasons for subscribing to religious pluralism, enlightenment, humility, and tolerance, they all backfire. They don't carry through. Religious pluralism isn't enlightened. It's inaccurate. It isn't humble. It's firstly dogmatic. And it isn't really all that tolerant because it intolerantly blunts religious distinctions. In a kind way, in a kind of different way, the faith of Jesus comes to us in a very interesting way. Who is Jesus? Well, Jesus has disclosed himself to his disciples during his days and up to this day. And Jesus is still telling us the very same things. Let's look at John 14, 6. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Egoi mihei odos kai hei, eleithei akai hei, zoei. 
As we understand it, Jesus comes to us often with a radical truth that often catch us in our unguarded ways. This is one of those instances and what the truth he gives. He uses the Greek in a very clear way. He said, Ego eimi hei hodos. Hei hodos. The way. I am the way. The use of the article in Greek is a full understanding of definiteness and radicalism. Jesus is the way and there is nobody else. Jesus is the way and there is nobody else. And that's the way. Jesus draws us to himself. When he walked that road, it's like he brings us to a realization of inability to do things by ourselves. One question I have to ask you. Can you really go to heaven by yourself? Can you really go to the Father by yourself, by your own efforts? When Jesus takes the arduous hike for us, actually, where did he go? He goes down into the valley where the criminals die. He hikes down into our sin, into our rebellion, our failures, and he heaps them all on his back and climbs on a cross where he is punished for our crime. It's a bloody, gruesome death. The innocent being punished for the guilty. If he doesn't take our punishment, then we must endure it, which means forever separation from God. If you reject Jesus, then you will pay the infinite consequences. However, if you embrace Jesus in his sin-absorbing death, you get forgiveness. And Jesus hikes not only through the valley, but up the mountain to carry your forgiveness to God, where he pleads our innocence. This is what it means for Jesus to be the way. He hikes into the valley of our just punishment and up the mountain for our forgiveness. He is actually the redemptive way. He takes our place. This understanding of Jesus as the way should make us incredibly humble, not arrogant. We realize how undeserving we are and how much mercy Jesus has shown to us. It will be a very, very wonderful Christian if we, following Jesus, truly show to the world how incredibly humble we are because of Jesus. Jesus also enlightens us. See, Jesus said he is the way, but he's, he's not just the way, he is also the truth. Ego emi hei aleitheia. In John chapter 1, we are told that God became flesh and was full of grace in, and truth in Jesus. The truth is that God is Jesus. God is Jesus. And let me tell you this, that Christianity is the only religion where God is born as a man, becomes fully human. There is no other religion or faith in the world that looks at God that way. He became human for us. And brothers and sisters, this is the height of enlightenment. All other religions teach that humans must work their way to God toward attaining divinity. The truth is Jesus. The truth is a person who dies in our place for our crimes and in truth gives us his life. The truth is that God works his way down to humanity and dies for us. That is grace. That is enlightenment coming from Jesus. The world today does not give us any understanding of who God is. Well, God is the being up there, and we try to come up with every definition that we can come up with about God. We always fail because, really, as created humans, our minds have been clouded by sin. Our understanding has been diminished in a lot of ways, and we cannot really think about the goodness of God, about who God is. We are thankful that we have the scripture which has given us 
so much understanding about who God is. Grace, grace in Jesus, and that's enlightenment coming from Jesus. Jesus also guides us to a persuasive tolerance where religious pluralism comes to us something like intolerance. That's exactly the opposite of Jesus. We have Jesus who is the life. He is he the way. Jesus. Jesus is the life. As if it wasn't enough to be our way, incredibly humbling, and the truth truly enlightening, Jesus caps it off by offering us not just his life, or not just his death, but his very own life. He goes down into the valley to take our death, and rises up from the dead, up to the other side of the valley, where he prepares a new place for us to enjoy life with him forever. The hope of Christ's life should break into the lives of Christians today, making us persuasively tolerant. We've come to grasp grace, that God works his way down to us, dies for our moral and religious failures, and finally offers us life. If, the, if this is true, and I hope you are agreeing with me that that is true because there is no other truth. And if this is true, we must lovingly, humbly try to persuade others to believe in Jesus. See, this is what I was telling you before. When we consider religious pluralism and the many seemingly good values that it simply tells us, we could live peacefully, we could live securely, we can be tolerant. Those are the kind of things that religious pluralism tell everyone. But when we come to grasp God's grace, God working his way down to us, dying for our moral and religious failures, and offers us life. And if this is true, we must lovingly, humbly try to persuade others, really, to believe in Jesus, who alone offers the wonderful promise of the way to God, the truth of God, and the life of God. Well, there is a final revelation. In the second part, he caps it off with a very radical declaration beyond any human value. He says, no one comes to the Father except through me. No one comes to the Father except through me. The Greek sentence says it all. Eme di emu. The emphasis is without equal. Using the very emphatic form, emu. You know, if it's not emphatic, it will only be using mu. But the epsilon was used to make it really become emphatic. And Jesus is saying this because he is really emphasizing to every individual born on this earth that the only way to God, the only way to the Father is through him who is the way, who is the truth, who is the life. Jesus Christ and religious pluralism, uh, as Christians, we have to make the choice. In the end, it doesn't matter how nice or moral a person is because there is not enough niceness or morality to pay for our rejection of God. Either we must be rejected by God or we turn to Jesus who was rejected for us. This is the heart of the gospel. The father rejecting his own son so that by that rejection we can obtain life. By that rejection we can see the way, we can see the truth, we can see life in Jesus. Yes, Jesus lays down his own life for those who reject him, for his enemies, for those who don't believe in him and offers them forgiveness. The question is, why would, we, why would we reject such a man, such a God? The claims of Jesus are better than the claims of religious plural, pluralism. As we ponder over our choice, 
we must make the continuing commitment to the Jesus who gave us the way, the truth, and the life. As I close, let me quote this which appears in our program placed by our academic person, Dr. Dolph Oberholster, who took Mrs. White's words, saying, If you are in communion with Christ, you will place his estimate upon every human being. You will feel for others the same deep love that Christ has felt for you. Then you'll be able to win, not drive, to attract, not repulse those for whom he died. Religious pluralism gives us promises. But those promises, as we carry on with life in this world, those promises do not get any better any day. Instead, we have destruction coming in, death coming in, people all over the world fighting one another. Jesus says, Peace I give to you, not like what the world gives, but I give it to you. And if we are truly followers of Jesus, let's take that promise of Jesus. And I know that many of us here, it being and having followed Jesus, have found that peace that only Jesus gives. Yesterday, we are trying to use the time, invest time, so we can explore religious and theological issues, particularly in this age of religious pluralism. But let it never occur to us that Jesus' call for commitment is a commitment that has an ending. He is calling us to have a continuing commitment to him. Why? Well, the time is short. Jesus is coming. One way or the other, God will manifest his work to give all peoples the chance to know him as the God of life and living. God waits for you and for me in this age of religious pluralism. He is asking every one of us to give him the chance to use us while we have time. So the question is given to all of us. How are we going to respond? Your response is something that you only can do. It's a response that I cannot do for you. I may be able to give you words and things that Jesus draws our attention to, but beyond that, I cannot control your choices. It's either that we can come, we come up with a continuing commitment to Jesus or we continue to turn our backs on him. You know, in a religious, scholarly places like Ayas, you learn many things. You learn the value of research. You learn the value of academics. You learn many, many things. However, there are many people who, in spite of learning those things, they seem to come up with a continuing commitment to give their lives to Jesus. God is asking you. Religious pluralism, it is something that we're going to be always working on. The world will continue to work with religious pluralism. But does it make sense for us? Religious pluralism, it will carry on. But there is one who is asking us to give our commitment to Jesus. May the Lord bless us and may the Lord continue to lead us as we try to work out the values of uh, religious pluralism. It's good in its own way, but something better than religious pluralism is being offered to us. It comes to us in the form of a person, in the form of a Jesus who loves you, who gave his life for you, who showed the way for you, who showed the truth for you, and is showing us that, yes, we can continue to have life in Jesus, not just here on this earth, but life beyond this earth. May the Lord continue to lead us and bless us as we think of continuing our studies 
for the Lord in whatever uh, kind of work or studies we are going to do. May the Lord bless us.